while folks are gathering, we wanted to take the opportunity to teach you a wee chorus because we're going to need it later on. And it's a little African song. But don't worry, you don't need to learn Kiswahili or anything like that. Um, you're or Luganda, since that's where Moira's from. But uh, it's all in English, but we thought we would teach you this wee song so that you can get the hang of it. So it goes like this. All the other gods, they are the works of man, but you are the most high God. There is none like you. You are the most high. You are the most high God. You are the most high. You are the most high God. So that's kind of most of it. So let's take a minute to learn it. I'll sing a line, you sing it back, and then we'll um, you'll get the hang of it. So it's, so it's all the other gods, they are the works of man. Goes like this. All the other gods, they are the works of man. Sing that. All the other gods, they are the works of man. Once more. All the other gods, they are the works of man. But you are the mighty God. There is none like you. But you are the most high God. There is none like you. Good. Put that all together. All the other gods, they are the works of man. But you are the most high God. There is none like you. And then the next bit, very easy. You are the most high. You are the most high God. That's it. Try it. You are the most high. You are the most high God. You are the most high. You are the most high God. You are the most high. You are the most high God. And there's one other wee bit. It's a wee bit trickier. That's the, the bridge, and it's quite fast. Um, or at least there's a lot of words. So it goes, You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. So lots of spitting out of the words. Try that bit. You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. Let's try the whole thing, all the other gods. All the other gods, they are the works of man, but you are the most high God. There is none like you, Jehovah. So you are the most high, you are the most high God, you are the most high. You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. Excellent. So there'll be variations on a theme of that a wee bit later on. And uh, well, Moira might even surprise us a little bit. So over to Gary. to KBC. Uh, this morning is Relief and Development Sunday, so one of the two Sundays in the year where we um, take an extra chance uh, to look at, out to the wider world um, and see what our place is in, in it and, and what we might do to serve God. Um, there's a special offering later uh, in the service this morning. The envelopes have gone out for the last couple of weeks, um, but just to let you know that you don't need to use the envelope um, to, to make the offering this morning. So all of our offering uh, beyond the regular budget will go to the two organizations that we're supporting this week. 
You'll hear a little bit more about them over the course of the service, but to introduce them both very quickly, uh, the offering will be divided between Cardis and EMS International, both organizations working in, in healthcare globally, and actually both with a focus on palliative care. So to introduce and welcome um, Moira Leng, who will be our uh, speaker this morning from, from Cardis. And we're also uh, thrilled to have, uh, to have Manju with us, who is a, a palliative care nurse uh, in Nepal, supported by EMMS. So we'll also hear from her in the course of this morning as well. One other brief announcement, so I'm going to invite Susan up to tell you a little bit about what is happening uh, through the prayer team for Lent. Looking around, there she is. Thanks, Gary. Good morning. The prayer and spirituality hub are really quite excited. I know that maybe by looking at me, you maybe not think I'm excited, but trust me, I am. Um, we're going to, during Lent, which is, starts on Valentine's Day, otherwise known as Ash Wednesday, and it runs till um, the 28th of March, um, which is the day before um, Good Friday. And what we're going to do is we're going to be having a prayer focus. And we've produced a booklet with lots of prayers for each day, a little Bible verse. And we thought that it would be really good if we all prayed together. Now, if you just take a look around the church just now at all these lovely faces, the amount of people here, the amount of people that will come to the second service or evening services, and all of these other people who couldn't make it this morning, if you just imagine all of us praying together and how powerful that would be. And, um, you know, when we ask, when we call on God, God asks us to call on him. And when we do, he answers us, he promises to answer us. And it would just be so amazing as when we were preparing for Easter, if we invited him in to prepare our hearts and change us from the inside out. All the details are in the, the booklet. Um, there are times there that you can choose to maybe set an alarm on your phone. Um, they may, those times may not suit you, but um, you can pray at other times. But it would just be good if we thought that the whole church were praying these prayers together. They're only sample prayers to get you going. Um, please use your, your own prayers as well. And let's see what our great God will do through this. If you've got any questions, it's just speak to anybody in the, the hub um, or myself or David and Andrew know about it as well. Okay, thank you. And since Susan has been talking to us about prayer, let's do that very thing right now. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come together as part of your family here in Kirkintilloch to praise you, to worship you, to hear from you, to hear about what you're doing across the world. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you chose to sacrifice your son for us. Forgive us for the times when our praise to you is feeble. Help us to be robust this morning and to worship you as you deserve to be worshipped. We pray too that you would give us open ears to hear what you would have, that you would say to us this morning, whether we're children or young people or grown-ups. And we just ask that you would have something to speak to each one of us about and help us to respond to you, to be obedient to what you have to say. Take our worship this morning uh, as we give it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. In a moment, we're going to sing our opening hymn, which is Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Now, I know that that, that hymn speaks about, you know, if we only had more than one voice, because one voice just kind of isn't enough. And, and sometimes we just need, we feel as if we need more than one voice to be able to praise God. But, you know, when you think about it on Relief and Development Sunday, we're, we, we think about the wider world. And in my work with Africa Inland Mission, we often talk about unreached people groups and how many different people groups and therefore different languages or tongues there are around the world that have yet to hear God's good news. But the Bible says that one day there will be some from every tongue 
standing before God, praising him. And I just find that really exciting. And I hope it excites you too, that one day we're going to be standing there with people from every tongue, every language um, that has ever been in the world or that ever will be praising God. So let's do that this morning. And if you're here and English is not your first language and you want to praise God in another language, feel free. Um, but let's lift our voices together as we sing this wonderful old um, hymn of praise, All for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Let's stand together. Assist me to proclaim and spread through all the world the honors of your name. We can do that in so many different ways through the work that we do, through the prayers that we give to God for the others around the world. And everyone in this world at some point needs compassion. We're going to sing in a moment, everyone needs compassion. Sometimes we think that the problems in the world are completely insurmountable. But this song says, Saviour, he can move the mountains. Now, whether that's a horrendous political situation or whether it's a terrible personal situation, he can move those mountains if it's his will to do that. And if he chooses not to, he can give us the strength to deal with the mountains and the issues in our life. But everyone needs compassion, and we have a responsibility to proclaim the Lord's love and to share his compassion with those around us, our neighbors, those in our workplace, those at the other end of the world. And we're going to be hearing some about that today. But as we sing this, let's maybe think about those that we can share God's compassion with and maybe use this as a prayer to help us to, to, to ask God to help us 
to share that compassion with everyone else. We're going to uplift our offering during this song, so we'll, we'll stay seated um, until the offering's uplifted. And that can be a part of sharing that compassion as well through the financial gifts that we give. So let's worship in our giving and in our singing as we sing this song together. Thank you and good morning. Um, I'm really happy to hear that since I was here last, we're doing a, a focus in the service for people who are young. I don't know who counts himself as young in the church. But this Sunday, I've got the pleasure of, of sharing with my, my uh, lovely friend Manju from Nepal about God's heart for wholeness and health. And we're going to be talking about what's happening in the world in terms of people having the help they need when they're sick. We're also going to think about what it means, means to be healthy. So I would like you guys, anybody who thinks they're young, to just help me to answer that first question, what makes us healthy? Anyone want to tell me? Yeah, you're going to have to shout for me. Vegetables, fabulous, yep. Running, brilliant. Cycling. Cycling. Jumping. Jumping up and down, very high. Excellent. Anything else? What makes us healthy? Fruits. 
I'm missing somebody. Yeah, hi. Racing. I think there's a lot of running and jumping and racing going on, yes? Playing basketball. Fabulous. Anything else anybody wants to add? And grown-ups, don't think that you're missing out on this because later on I'm going to ask you, yes, please? Football. So we've thought, and you've come up with some really good suggestions of what makes us healthy. Things that we eat, things that we do. Yep. We're also going to think a bit later, too, that some of the things that makes us healthy is having the freedom to choose, being able, when we're sick, to get the care we need, maybe even having the opportunity to to have things that you guys uh, take for granted, possibly, like good education, and have a sense of meaning and purpose in your life. And the problem in our world is things are not fair. In about three years ago, they measured how 3.5 billion of the poorest people, are you with me? And they measured how many rich people owned the same amount of money. That was about four years ago. So the same amount of money as 3.5 billion of the poorest people. And five years ago, it was about 86 people. Do you get that? So 86 people had the same amount of money as the 3.5 billion poorest. But then they measured it again this year, end of last year. And how many people now do you think have the same amount of money as the poorest 3.5 billion? It used to be 86. How many do you think it is now? 50, good guess. No, oh, uh uh-huh. 100, lower, lower, yep, 95, lower, 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 yep, 85, you're all wanting it to be high, I want it to be lots lower, 40, we're getting lower, one more chance, 30, do you know what, it's 8, isn't that amazing, the world is becoming so much more unequal, and that is affecting. Now, some of those eight people are some of the great philanthropists of the current era, such as, for example, Bill Gates. So I'm not saying they're bad people, but how unequal is our world? Um, I have. Some of you might have seen this picture, and this is the first one is three kids, and they're uh, trying to see over to watch a football game. Sorry for all of those of you who are Scottish yesterday, but the Irish really liked watching their uh, rugby match, David, I think. Yes. In the first one, we're trying to make everything equal. We're giving everybody the same size of box to stand on. Is that fair? What do you think about that first, first picture? Do you think this is fair? Can he see? Why can't he see? He's only got, very good, he's only got one box, and he's really little. And some of you have got little brothers and sisters, and your mum say, just wait for them to catch up. Maybe give them a head start. Do you ever hear them say that? So sometimes what we're saying is the world actually needs something called equity. That means we have to make things equal. And in this picture, you can see they've given him more boxes than this one because he needs more boxes to be able to see. And in our service today and tonight, we're going to be thinking a bit more about what that means. But you mentioned a lot of exercise, and I want to bring you greetings from my church in Uganda, Logogo Baptist Church. This was our love feast, and the theme was color, and I made 21 cakes of rainbow colors. Um, Sorry, I don't have any for you this morning. But what I do have is a little bit of baobab, baobab's very special tree. So if you want to taste a bit of baobab tree, it's out there outside. But thank you for praying for our church. And some of you heard a bit about one of these wee girls, Opera, when I spoke with the Sunday School before. And I was so happy that when you sent me some Christmas cards, which I loved, you also sent two to Opera. And she's written back. And I don't know if either Lois or Katie are here this morning. Either Lois or Katie? I think she hasn't quite spelt your name right, but I think you've got, you want to come out? A card from Opera. Isn't that lovely? Opera is this wee one here. She lives next door to the church. This is her family. I asked her, thank you very much. I asked her to um, send a message, and that's 
their message. And thank you so much. And she would just love it if you guys also wanted to write to her again. So thank you so much for writing her that Christmas card. And one of the things we love to do in church is to dance. And you've all told me that you like exercise. So would you mind dancing with me like we do in my church at home? So I'm going to give you a wee clip. And then I'm going to dance. I've prompted a few adults to come. But I'd love if any of the kids would like to come and see if you can dance. Do a bit of exercise to make yourself healthy. But also praise God uh, like they do in my church in Uganda. And here's a wee clip just to see. And I think uh, we'll see them dancing. can't let these folk dance around and not stand up at least and have a wee dance where you are and if you want to join the, the line dancing feel free You're out of breath now. <laughs> Gary. Okay, um, I'm going to invite uh, Manju up uh, again. And, and while she's coming up, I wonder if there is anyone who knows how we might greet someone from Nepal who is, who is visiting us. Any, any guesses? Uh, there are some obvious people here who might know the answer. So, Catherine, can you help us out? Catherine, how would we say welcome? Namaste. So, yeah, so it was hands together and uh, namaste. 
Uh, we're going to watch just a, a very brief uh, video that shows you uh, Manju at work, first of all, while we get her uh, A Scottish in. charity is currently working in Nepal to try to improve access to health care in some of the poorest parts of the country. EMS, EMMS International has funded their first ever specialist palliative care nurse, as well as providing help for those reaching the end of their lives. They're also training other medical professionals. In the first in a series of special reports, a reporter Susan Ripple has been to meet her in the shadow of the Himalayas. These small steps mean the world to Pabitra. For the past five years, she had been bedbound after sustaining a spinal injury following a fall. But thanks to the help of this nurse, she can now make the short walk from her home to the hospital for a physiotherapy appointment. I was afraid of what would happen to me and I was afraid of how my family would feel. Now I feel much better and it's good to be able to walk to the hospital and leave my home. My daughter is very happy. She says, mummy is getting better. She's well now. If my daughter's happy, I'm happy. Manju has been working at the Mission Hospital in Tanzen for the past three months. She's the country's first specialist palliative care nurse, a position funded by the Edinburgh charity EMMS International. Nepal is vastly under-resourced when it comes to providing help with serious illnesses and conditions. There are just 10 centres providing palliative care, only one in rural Nepal. A staggering figure as more than 80% of the country's population lives in these remote areas. Here, Manju is explaining to this man that his mother is too frail for aggressive surgery, advising him the best course of action would be to end the life support. Two hours after filming, she died. When we know that patient is not going to improve, it is really hard to tell them, to tell them what will be the outcome. But the simple thing, when I see, even they are in the suffering stage, in the, they are in that uh, critical stage, if you can bring the smile on their face, I think that is the big thing. They trust me, they trust palliative care. Manju has not only helped Pavitra physically, but also mentally. Pavitra's husband left her after the accident. Her mother could only watch as her daughter fell deeper into depression. She still feels guilty the family were unable to afford the health care Pavitra needed. She was in bed for a long time and I couldn't offer her treatment, so I felt sad. Now I'm very happy and now that she's able to walk around, I feel positive. Manju has now finished her placement here and is moving on to Kathmandu. As the interview came to an end, Pabitra said her goodbyes. An emotional time, showing her gratitude to a woman who listened and cared. Susan Ripoll, STV News, Tanzan in Nepal. So I was there um, with, with STV meeting Manju that time, and I've seen this video dozens of times now, but that last bit at the end when you see just how much uh, the care that Manju has, had given to Pabitra meant to her, uh, every time I, I always choke up a bit on, on the end of that video. Um, so Manju, could you tell us just a little bit about how you came to meet Pabitra and what your job was as a palliative care nurse. What sort of things did you have to do to help her? So the thing about that, um, the soon after I joined, um, uh, I start palliative care service uh, uh, with INF International 2016. So I was there in somewhere in March in Tansen Mission Hospital. Uh, actually, I was there for um, short uh, my days off, and I got to uh, I met one of my friend. Actually, she's Korean, but she uh, work in nursing school, and they run this uh, children library. So since she heard that I'm working with palliative care, so she means, uh, so this Pavitra's daughter, who is like um, uh, ten years, uh, she comes to this uh, children library. And I, obviously they have this interaction, so uh, this Korean lady, she came to know about this uh, lady, Pavitra. And maybe it is your job or not, but I would like you to come with me and see this patient. Because the story was, uh, she was uh, married and in the village. 
and she, while she was working in the like a hillside, she was cutting grass, and she fell down and had injury in her spine. So she was not able to perform her daily activities and all that. So she was kind of rejected from her husband and the family in the village. So she was returned back to her parents, who are like father is the is a tailoring uh, work he does, and they are very from poor family. And they came to hospital, and hospital advised them to go to the higher center. They got some support from the hospital, but to meet up this, uh, you know, go to higher center and uh, take up all this financial burden, they were not able. So, like, just with the physio's help, she was in house, and. Uh, I came to know about this story only after five years. So when this lady, the Korean lady, she told me about this story, she was already in house for five years. And she was completely homebound, actually kind of bed bounded. She was very thin. She was not able to, um, even uh, without support, she was not able to uh, get out of the bed and doing her activities. So she will need all the assistance for her job, like the basic care. So that's how I came to know Pabitra, and then um, I had to do some networking with um, um, hospital and the surrounding community with her family and with physio and all that. And a good thing that we have good hospital, Mission Hospital there, who are very happy to take her and um, process further. So I was kind of more than palli just from the palliative side. Maybe it is not considered as a, like a really palliative care. She was not in the end stage. But we are doing the kind of mediator work as well. Um, so this is part of uh, Pavitra. Thank you. Um, and so when you, when you very first met her, she, her family thought she couldn't walk again, that she, that she would spend the rest of her life on the mattress in the corner uh, of her room. And we see at the end of the video that she, that she was walking, that that is, that is quite a, a transformation. Yeah. Um, but as you say, she's sort of one of the lucky ones in, in many ways. If you're, if you're seriously ill in Nepal, what sort of challenges will you, will you face? So like this Pavitra, she was, um, if you have some uh, serious illnesses like that, either due to the uh, financial uh, issues or the transportation, geographical structure, and getting to the proper uh, health facilities, it has always been challenged. So I think recently we uh, made a visit in one of the uh, earthquake affected uh, area. And the, most of their, you know, their expression was like, okay, what, because for the, even for the basic care, they have to go to very quite far for the treatment. And there are not a good road for the transportation of the patient. Because of that, like, okay, we will, so we were asking, what do you do for, you know, treatment? Or like, if you need health assessment or a support. And they said, like, we'll work as far as we can. The day we cannot work more, that will be like the end of the day end of the life. So meaning they will be working until last stage. So early diagnosis and early treatment is like uh, still the problem. And for the last few weeks, you've been working in a hospice in Edinburgh. So you've seen just the difference between healthcare here and healthcare in Nepal. Uh, yeah, what, how would you describe the difference? Um, I was very privileged to come all the way here and uh, see the uh, medical facilities, medical benefit here in, uh, uh, through your government. And I would say you are very lucky, <laughs> you are very blessed uh, that you have good health system, you have a good uh, social and health security, which in Nepal it is, um, we are very behind. Um, I was in this hospice and you have very nicely, you know, um, uh, structured. Like they are, you have physical symptom control, psychosocial and a spiritual aspect. Maybe that is a, I mean, uh, I don't know that's a word to describe or not. But it is not just thinking about your physical pain, your suffering. They so nicely uh, manage their, you know, um, how to encourage them 
Yes, they have this illnesses, they have this long-term problem which is not going to be cured, not going to be, you know, recover, but they have very nicely done this, uh, how to give them comfort and quality of life as far as they, that is possible. And uh, I'm happy. Uh, we don't have that system, but at least uh, we have, um, in, in our setting, we, uh, we try to offer whatever is possible from our side. So like giving time to listen to the, uh, the client who are in suffering. Maybe we are not able to provide the same setting, you know, but we are able to listen to their uh, suffering, which has not been like people not been able to hear them, hear them for a long time. So maybe they have so many things deep inside what the clients are waiting that somebody will come and like will be able to express. So I think this is what uh, we are offering at the moment in, in Nepal. Like we are uh, in early stage. Uh, so I have seen so many different things here. So hopefully I, will, um, I look forward to go back and implement that in a various way. And thank you for this opportunity. Uh, just one, one very last question. Manju, how can we pray for you in the work that you're doing? Um, I would like to uh, make big request, prayer request to all of you for your uh, precious prayer for me. Uh, you all know I'm an uh, only palliative nurse at the moment, uh, working with non-communicable, non-cancer disease in Nepal. So we have just started this work in one of the rural hospital in west of Nepal and from one small area where in Nepal you have like we have 80 percent of the people are living in a very remote area who doesn't have good health service who doesn't have good transportation who doesn't have health awareness so we have a long way to go uh, many people to reach out so please you can pray for me and people uh, new people to join joining hand helping hand uh, with the same compassion uh, with a caring heart and uh, serving uh, God. Thank you. Um, I think it might be just nice to give Manju just a little round of applause. As a uh, thanks so much. We'll have uh, another song when the, when the children are are going to leave us during that um, and then just after that Catherine is going to come up and pray for uh, for Manju and Moira in the work that, that they do okay yeah children you've been very patient um, now's the time for you to head off to your Sunday groups this morning and enjoy that and enjoy your learning there we're going to sing a song that gives us a chance to rejoice in the fact that one day Manju and Moira's work will no longer be needed because one day all pain and suffering will be gone and God will have righted everything that is wrong and we'll be able to stand and sing in a place where the streets shine with the glory of the Lamb. So let's uh, stand and sing this if you stand if you're able and we'll sing this song together. There's a place.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are Father to all peoples, and you love them and they long that they would know you too. You care for the downtrodden and the suffering. And we thank you for these sisters, for Manju and Moira. We thank you for their love for you and the service that you draw them to. We thank you for the way that they are both able to network within their own uh, countries in Nepal and indeed Moira throughout the world. We pray that as you have laid on their hearts the struggle that many people go through, you've gifted them with your love and you pour out your love to, through to these people. And often these people are dying, Father, and their families need such support and indeed such compassion. We pray that you would strengthen them to do what you've called them to do. And we pray that the money that's been given today would help to make this happen. Protect them as they travel and protect them from the evil one. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So good morning again. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, I know many of you, but, it, but I moved to this church as a nine-year-old child um, and grew up in this church. And it was really as part of this church that I really I sensed God's call on my life to international work, although at the time I thought that would be the more traditional role of working in mission hospitals. And I'll share a bit of, of the work that we do uh, in a moment. But this church used to have a tradition, I don't know if you still have it, of writing to people and confirming that as a church, they felt also God's call on their life in particular ways. And I was privileged to receive one of those letters many years ago. And today I stand uh, really delighted to be here and to be sharing it with Manju and with Ruth, because this time last year, I... Uh, was with um, them both in India or just after this time and then I went to Kathmandu saw something of the work that Manju was doing there and something of the work amongst post-earthquake victims um, and I think there was even a bit of a wedding dress shopping Manju oh. <laughs> and since then she made a very beautiful bride so what, what a joy it is that the Lord managed that because Gary I don't think you could have planned that if we tried no <laughs> and we're here to, to on World Development Sunday to share with you something of what we mean by health. I also just want to share an exciting and challenging issue that as a global health world, they're beginning to use language that actually comes straight from scripture. 
And I'm hoping as I share this morning, you'll see what I mean by that and kind of catch the vision that we can really, as a church, make a difference in individual people's lives, but also in transforming our societies, transforming practice, transforming lives. And when I looked at the vision of KBC, that's what you talk about in your mission, don't you? You talk about holistic mission, transformational mission. And this is not World Mission Sunday, it's World Development Sunday, but our world needs transformation. And as Christians, we have an incredible message of transformation to bring. Now, I asked the kids this, and I don't know if I, you've had some more thoughts since I asked the kids. They tended to think of some of the physical things that make us healthy, and that's what I would expect. We think about being free of disease. We think about, um, I can't actually see that from here, but you can see it there, yep, accessing health care. And we think about being emotionally well, mental health, quite rightly, is receiving a lot more attention at the moment because it's been a neglected area. Are there any other things you would have put on that list to make you healthy? Let's see what I put. I'm just going to stand back to see it. Belonging to a family and community. Belonging, a sense of connectedness, is actually an essential ingredient of spiritual health. A sense of belonging. And I know that's something at Kirky, Kirky Baptist you take very seriously in the way in which you seek to care for the community here and also partner with us internationally. Basic housing and food. The food bank runs from here. We are very keen on this in our societies, to be independent, to be able to take care of ourselves. Not such a big issue in other societies, but often dignity and taking care of ourselves is very important for our sense of well-being. Good standards of living, healthy environment. Nepal, I think, this time last year was pretty full of smog, wasn't it, in Kathmandu? Most people are wearing masks, and uh, certainly I think I spent the whole two weeks coughing. Enough resources, whatever that means in your context, what does enough resources mean? The ability to work, to have a good education, but maybe some of these other things. What about justice? I showed the kids that picture. We'll look at it again. What does that mean in terms of health and well-being? What about the ability to achieve your dreams, to have opportunity? What about hope and meaning? What about beauty and creativity? What about faith and love? All of these are components of our well-being. All of these are components of wholeness. And, and Manju's already mentioned how we bring that concept of wholeness into palliative care, and I'll talk more about that, but bringing in those physical aspects, but also the things that affect us in the way we live socially with one another, in our financial uh, issues, in our community, the things that, that worry us, that concern us, and of course, the thing, most important thing, the thing that gives us meaning and hope and purpose, which as Christians, we have an incredible gospel to share. Now, there's one country in the world that has measured its health by a happiness index. So they have something called the Gross Happiness Index. And I know there might be at least two people who've been here quite recently here this morning. What country measures Gross Happiness Index, Marjorie and John? Bhutan, and here's a picture of Bhutan, I think. Yep, here we go. So they've actually tried to say, are we the happiest nation? And I've got a number of indicators they're using, lots of controversies about it. And actually in those indicators come most of those things we've just mentioned, including environment, including uh, resilience. An interesting idea. So what does this mean for the young woman with cervical cancer in rural Uganda, a cancer that's the commonest in the world and yet we don't see it here because we have prevention and early detection and treatment options. What does it mean for the, the people with chronic lung disease in Nepal that um, Manju was talking about, the commonest cause of admission with life-threatening illness to Tansen Hospital in the study that you did? What does it mean for people affected by war and conflict who are migrants and displaced. 
And I want this morning to share something of the good news that we have to offer and to tell you a bit more about what is happening globally, particularly in relation to health. And then to focus in on our response to that. And in doing so, I'll share some of the work that I'm privileged to be engaged with as a mission partner from here. So our work is also your work. Uh, and to share a bit more about that and some of the stories and the voices of those who I meet. But I've been uh, travelling in the Middle East for, uh, for the last few years. And actually, thanks to um, support from this church, I was able to visit some of the sites near where um, Jesus lived and preached, um, and it's quite incredible to do that. But I want to take you back to the very first time that Jesus stood up to read the scriptures. Some of you will know that passage very well. It's from Luke's Gospel, but it takes you back to uh, a passage in Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. And of course, we know that Jesus came to fulfill the prophets. But if you think about what was expected, a Messiah that was going to come and change the political state of the world, overthrow the Roman Empire, was going to come and, and free the Jewish people from oppression. And, and a lot of the Old Testament prophets were interpreted in that way. So here you are, you have Jesus standing up, opening the scrolls. And what does he choose to read? How does he choose to launch his ministry. I like if you would, I'm sorry this text is small, but if you can, to read with me from Isaiah, not the whole passage that he read that morning. He read a portion that morning. So would you read with me? The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Amazing uh, prophecy that Jesus was saying, this is what I am bringing. And the kingdom of God, as we know, and I'm not going to get into theology, go, to, go to, to, to David and Andrew for that, but this amazing sense that the kingdom of God is already here within us. And as a church, we are living as kingdom people. Of course, the, the total fulfillment of the kingdom of God, we have not yet seen. And we will one day see, and we, see, and we sang that in the song. One day there will be no more tears and sadness. But we do live now as kingdom people. We live as kingdom people who have an incredible gospel of good news that is salvation. And that salvation is going to be seen spiritually. Some of the freedoms talked about in that verse are talking about freedoms from bondage, freedoms from sin, freedoms from the spiritual darkness. But he also is talking about the very physical realities of injustice. And we see that throughout scripture. Our God is a God who hates injustice, who loves justice. And he asks us as a church to be engaged in that same work, to bring that good news of freedom and hope and joy and justice, to bring beauty and love into the most broken and the most uh, hurting places in our society, and to show that the kingdom of God is here and one day will be uh, completely and fully new in this world. So let me share you some global issues. There's a lot of good news. This is a graph. I'm going to show you lots of graphs, so apologies. And if you don't like pictures, I'll try and explain them. But this is showing that efforts over the last, uh, particularly couple of decades, have reduced the number of people in extreme poverty. Um, we also have seen an increase in access to things like medicines for people with HIV AIDS. Vaccines, a big issue, 
and some of those rich people I mentioned, Bill Gates, he and his wife have been helping looking for vaccines, even for Ebola, the most recent um, infectious disease that killed so many people in West Africa. So we are seeing huge changes, and there's many other good things we could share. But unfortunately, what we're seeing is that the poorest of the poor are not changing. And in fact, they may become even more poor than they were before. The world, has, the world Health and UN organizations have coined some new goals. They used to call them the Millennium Development Goals, and now they've called them something called the Sustainable Development Goals. And some of you may have heard of these. And I want to just read this phrase you see there. These goals, there are 17 of them, there's 169 targets. If you're a researcher in the room, you know how difficult that is. But just read this phrase. To end extreme poverty, to fight inequality and justice, and to protect our planet, and all by 2030. <laughs> They're ambitious, eh? But does that not ring true with some of what we were hearing when we, we thought of what Jesus said he was here to do? And I think it's quite exciting that globally there is a movement to say this isn't about helping the poor people. This is about rich and poor uh, coming together because some of these issues, for example, environmental issues, are, are at the moment affecting high-income countries more than low-income countries. So this is a way of trying to say how can we come together. And there's phrases in these documents which I love, phrases that say there should be none left behind. And that's why I chose this title for the talk this morning. None left behind. There's phrases that talk about the healing of the nations. And this evening at the 6.30, we'll be talking more about healing of the nations. Isn't that incredible that UN documents talk about the healing of the nations and leaving none behind? And this complicated slide is trying to say that health, which is this green one here, health is affected by what's happening in the environment what's happening in our cities, by pollution, by gender inequalities. It's affected by poverty and education. People without education are less likely to access uh, health care, for example. All of these things come together and encouraging all nations to get involved in that mission. And one of the terms used is health for all. And this next video uh, talks about that, talks about this concept of universal health coverage or health for all, and whether that is simply a health issue or whether perhaps an economic issue. And my thanks to our AV guys who are going to play that. The head of the World Health Organization called it the single most powerful concept that public health has to offer. A solution that can stop the world's biggest killers, from HIV, TB and malaria, to cancer and heart disease. It can help advance gender equality, build resilience to threats like climate change and disease outbreaks, and put us on the path to ending poverty. Health for All, also known as universal health coverage, may be the key to sustainable development. How? First, it's about keeping everyone as healthy as possible. Health is a human right, at least it should be. With proven, affordable tools to save lives, we have the opportunity to make the poor as healthy as the rich. But too many people are still waiting for access to essential health services. Universal health coverage is also about protecting people from poverty. Health services don't grow on trees. The problem is, the people who need the most are often the least able to pay. Every year, almost one in five people in low- and middle-income countries are pushed or pushed further into poverty paying for health. Imagine choosing between buying medicine and feeding your family, staying healthy or staying out of bankruptcy. It's a vicious cycle that makes it impossible for the poorest to get ahead and holds entire societies back. By ensuring both good health and financial stability, Universal health coverage opens doors for all people to reach their full potential. When everyone is healthy enough to go to school or work and has the ability to invest in their futures, families are better off, communities are stronger and countries are more resilient. Don't just take my word for it. Hundreds of leading economists called universal health coverage one of the best investments a country can make. 
So if we know that it's right and smart, the real question is, what are we waiting for? It's time to deliver on the promise of health for all, because it's right, smart and overdue. Do you know what's the best cell health system in the world? There's, there's a group that, that uh, measure this every so often. What do you think is measured as the best health system in the world? Any suggestions? It is the UK. What's been shown is that we're just holding on to that top spot and no more. And I think you guys know better than anyone how stretched the NHS is, but we still have the best health system in the UK. But in many parts of the world, people genuinely, I'm sure Manju, uh, Ruth, have to choose, do I pay for my children's food or do I buy the medicines? And that's a pretty grim choice. In Uganda, it's often, do I take the kids out of school in order to look after a relative who's got a chronic illness? Because this inequality exists, this is what I told the kids about, that nowadays, uh, eight men hold the same wealth as the poorest 3.6 billion, which is pretty terrifying, isn't it, in terms of sharing out the world's resources. I showed this picture, but in fact, I think this one explains it even better because the reality is that third one, where it's not just that we're one box away, some folk are at the top of a tower and the other are deep underground with no chance of seeing over that wall. And what's really needed is actually justice and liberation tearing down that wall and saying we are all human, we are all the same, we have basic rights. Britain is one of the, the places that really uh, stands up for international human rights. Slavery is more common now than at any time in history. We talk a lot about and we see the controversies over the statues um, in the US that seem to promote those who uh, supported slavery, but it's more prevalent now than it ever was. And I wonder what the abolitionists of, of our previous generations, many of whom are Christians, would say now when they see the number of trafficked people in our world. These are some maps which are a bit funny because the area of the map reflects the issue that I'm talking about. So this is a map that shows where most of the, the disease burden, so where most of the people who are ill are. And does anything strike you about it when you look at it? you can see that a lot of what we call the Western world has almost disappeared on this map. Because in fact, it's not just infectious disease, but what Manju called non-communicable disease, cancer, mental health, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, diabetes, all of these things are actually more common in low-income countries as well. And so this is the map of the burden of disease. Now I'm going to see, show you two more maps. And those ones are about access to healthcare. So are you ready for this? This is where the disease burden is. And this is where the doctors are. And I'm very grateful to the Lord that I have the chance to work in some of these countries, not necessarily just out of compassion. Compassion is important. But because it's just not right. It's not just. And we have to train the next generation. As Manju said, she doesn't want to be the only palliative care trained nurse in Nepal for long. Just in case there are nurses here, it's almost as bad for nurses. And if we look at another health issue, and that is children, this is where mothers die in the world having babies. Let me just flick those again. So this is where diseases are. This is where the doctors are. This is where the nurses are. And this is where women get into trouble and labor, another hugely important part of health. It isn't right. I mentioned slavery. We also have more displaced people at this time uh, than any other time in history. Many of them displaced internally or to countries round about, some of them becoming refugees and migrants abroad. And I know that we worry in Europe a lot about this. And we've tried to put in ways to handle it. And some of those ways I'll mention tonight have actually made some of these situations worse. But which countries do you think have the most refugees? Because as we talk about it in Europe, we almost give the impression that we do, that everybody's wanting to get to Europe. And there's too much on the slide, but it's basically saying that the four countries with the most refugees at the moment are, top of the list is Turkey. 
And then pretty, pretty close behind is Pakistan, Lebanon, and Uganda's up there with one million refugees from South Sudan. And again, I'll talk more about that tonight, and we're about to try and do some work looking at what is happening to people in those camps. So the poorest countries in the world, some of the poorest countries in the world, are taking the refugees. And this tells you about universal health coverage. We have some North Americans here, and North America is the very obvious country that's rich, that doesn't have access to health. In general, it's the poorest countries that don't have access to health. So what does that mean for us as Christians? What does it mean for us to leave none behind? Because I think as people of, the, of God, of people of the kingdom, we've got something really important to say about, first of all, injustice. And this is a church that I know cares about that. And I know there's so many ways that you're engaged personally and as a church in fighting injustice. And thank you for the support of, of, of ministries like ourselves because that is also at the heart of what we're doing. Yes, we're teaching, we're training, we're caring, but we're also trying to see if we can change systems and laws and in, you know, educational institutions so that we actually change this dynamic so there are more people to care for those in need in Nepal and in many other parts of the world. And we're currently involved in working in about five or six different parts of the world, mostly Africa, the Middle East and South Asia. We have to be a voice for the voiceless. I'll tell you a story or two in a moment. And to try and see if we can be salt and light in our generation. Here's one of the things that I work with. This is another map, but this is showing that 5.5 billion, it's difficult to get these numbers into your head, isn't it? Most of the world don't have pain control. And one of the things that I work with is with governments and policies to try and make sure that we begin to change this. Nepal, I think a year ago, you signed in your first policy on palliative care, which is brilliant, that will we'll start one of the ingredients that makes a difference. But this report only came out two months ago and it called this situation an abyss. That was the name in the Lancet title, a disaster. And palliative care is about holistic care. It's about reducing suffering. It's about adding quality um, days to life, not just life to days. Sorry, life to days, not just day, days to life. And I want to tell you a story, Muhammad. I met Muhammad in Gaza. And I'll talk a bit more about Gaza tonight, but that's a very difficult place to live. It's, it's really a, like an open prison. There's two million people, most of them refugees, and they're not allowed to leave. Very difficult place to be. And of course, there are political issues there, but I want you to think of the ordinary person in Gaza. Ten years under siege, um, just the last few days, about six of the hospitals have had to close because they've run out of fuel. The sewage system is leaking into the water. It's been declared unfit for human habitation by 2020, and they changed that to 2018. Mohammed, uh, as a young man, fought in the last war, which was an uprising against what they see as the oppression of Israeli state. And two of his friends were killed. And I met Mohammed when he had developed uh, jaundice and a liver problem. And he thought it was because he had some shrapnel from the bomb that killed his friends that got into his liver. But in fact, sadly, he had a cancer that is not very common in this country, but is common in parts of the world, such as Gaza, or places where hepatitis B infection is common. He's got liver cancer. And I was talking to his father, and his father couldn't get beyond the fact that 13 times Muhammad had got to the border to go over for treatment in the Palestinian hospitals of East Jerusalem, but was turned back. And that's the normal for people in Gaza, even if the treatment is there, they're not able to access it. And his father was consumed with anger about that. And I was with medical students trying to help them understand how can we communicate with people? How can we talk about difficult things? How can we help Muhammad? And the situation was a wee bit tense with this very distressed father. And so I just said to Muhammad, Muhammad, tell me what's important to you in life? What gives your life hope and meaning? And he talked about his, his faith, but he also held up this picture. I don't know if you can see it, but that's his son. And he was telling me, this is what gives me hope. This is what gives me meaning. And bringing and exploring and helping people grow spiritually and find hope and meaning in suffering is vital. 
And as Christians, I think we need to seek out those who are lost and broken and vulnerable. Whether they're in Gaza, where I have the privilege of traveling, whether they're in Nepal, whether they're here around us in our own communities, because we have good news to bring them. But I want to just mention too that sometimes what we bring is not solutions. Sometimes what we bring is not answers. This is a quote from a, a doctor who works with newborn ch children, very early, premature babies. And he said, he's a Christian, he said, suffering is not a problem that demands a solution or a question that demands an answer, but a mystery that demands a presence. And I think sometimes we are the presence of God in these broken situations, in these hard situations. I met Simon a few years ago, and he had a very nasty tumour, and I won't go into his story in great detail, but this first quote was what he told us he felt, with, felt before we met him. My world is full of pain and suffering. I am alone. No one seems to care. It feels like life had no meaning. It's a lovely Christian young man, but had gone through a really terrible time with his illness, had not been seen his son for some time because he didn't want his son to see a quite disfiguring tumour. It's been removed now in that picture. We asked him what difference palliative care meant. Listen to what he says. They talked to you. They talked to me. They encouraged me. They helped me to get medication. The pain has become manageable. There was tremendous improvement. I didn't feel like the way I was when they found me. And at the bottom here, the support has helped me to know that God cares for everyone, regardless of their situation. For Simon, there was a sense for him that the palliative care team were sent from God. Wasn't that a huge privilege? To bring hope and meaning back into a life that had lost it because of the distress. This church helped found this ministry in, uh, when you came and visited and in the donation you gave. There is now a, a team called the Sanyu Ministry, which has on their t-shirts, bringing hope, bringing joy. Uh, I think you'll recognize people in that team who now visit the local hospital. We've trained them to do pastoral care, bringing hope and bringing joy into that busy hospital. And we, you, some of you have helped us with the, the pig project that we're doing to try and raise income to fund that. So we seek out the excluded and vulnerable, but can I just mention just very briefly that we do that not because we are good and that we've got all the answers. We do it because we know that we are sinners saved by grace. We're not the saviors and they're not the victims. That's a very dangerous idea. I'll talk about this with the young folk tonight or with the 630 service. And if you want to read this book, if you want to think more about that, then I highly recommend it. Because what's important is to realize that the fall, that sin broke our relationship with God, but also with each other. That's why the world's unequal the way it is. It broke our relationship with the environment, with creation. And it's only by coming back to that place of realizing our equality before God that we'll be able to move on. Because, you know, Jesus has said that one day he is going, or there is going to be a moment where he's going to notice and point out those who care for the sick, who give clothing to the naked. And he's going to say that when you do that, you're doing it as if you're doing it for me. We talk in Cardis about transforming practice. And uh, I think you've mostly got a leaflet about Cardis and there's some more information there. Transforming lives. This woman had, a, had twins and um, one of the twins when they were born, she was so sick, the, the, husband, the father was not around. The twin was actually taken off by a dog just next to the church in the Guru area where some of the church visited. And her seven-year-old brought it back. And I don't know if you can see, but she's got a wee scar on her face here. But she was in church dedicating that, those children to the Lord because one of the elders, one of the, one of the deacons, sorry, had found that family and had brought them. And as a church, we're loving that family. And that was a chicken we got for her on Thanksgiving Day. I have the privilege of working with colleagues from Africa from Nepal, mind you, and uh, Ruth, I think, are both in this picture. From Uganda, where we're training leaders. From Mauritania, uh, where there's a fantastic programme developing. Sometimes evaluating programmes. Actually, this is an EMS programme in Malawi that I was asked to evaluate. This is a young kid that has cerebral palsy because of malaria, getting children's palliative care support. And this was just, if you're wondering why I've got this in my hands, I'm just back from Khartoum where we were helping launch the first ever diploma in palliative care. 
we're able to work with fractured societies. And this is something I have a real vision to see if we can do more of to work with the refugee situations, uh, particularly at the moment in the Middle East, in Sudan and in northern Uganda. But this is the first ever class to learn some of these skills in Gaza. And this is a word round that I told you where we met Mohammed, with these young students learning how to offer this care themselves and making a difference in their own setting. And I asked them, what does palliative care mean? And these are the words they used. Hope, love, dignity. We see people coming and volunteering. Medical students who tell us that their lives have been changed and their future practice have been changed. We even see some crazy folk from Kirky coming to visit us. And I think you will agree what you saw and experienced also impacted your life. And we see people like this. This is a young a nurse from the north of Zambia I worked with for a number of years, just last two weeks ago, getting her degree. She worked hard for that. We supported her financially, but boy, did she work hard. And even to get to that place, she spent nine days on a bus, brought five of her family, and was over the moon excited to be there. And Chenjerai. Chenjerai came from Zimbabwe, and Chenjerai had had to take out an advance loan against his wife's salary in order to be for the training. And some of us realised how hard things were for him and just gave a bit of money uh, to his situation. And he wrote to me afterwards and said that God had answered his prayer, that the money we had given without knowing was exactly the same amount of money that he'd taken in advance salary that was the food for their family for the next month. Now, these are the leaders in their settings. These are the Manjus in Zimbabwe, in Zambia, and across the nation. And if you want to hear more about what we're doing, please do look at uh, our Facebook, join up, sign up, get involved, and there's some more information to do that. But finally, leaving none behind, we have the most amazing privilege to be Christ's ambassadors. Isn't that amazing? We might think it would be great to meet the um, British ambassador to wherever. Some friends of mine in Uganda met the American ambassador. We're very excited as Americans to meet, as North Americans, to meet their ambassador. But you are all Christ's ambassadors. You have the privilege of taking this message of reconciliation, this message of justice, this good news of freedom to a hurting world, to love even when it's costly, to uh, go where the Lord calls us, to serve where he puts us, and to know that that hope is for now, but is also for the future when one day there will be no more suffering and no more hurting and no more pain. Thank you for allowing me to share this morning. Thank you for the support you give. I wish you well as you are ambassadors in where you are. And I thank you for the way in which you are supporting uh, this work across, uh, across the world. Thank you. As we draw our service to a close, let's remind ourselves in our final hymn of the That's work okay. and the love okay. of Christ, whose ambassadors we are. And as he demonstrated that love to us, that's the same love that we need to demonstrate to others in whatever practical ways that we can. So let's stand and sing together, Here is Love.
Uh, one thing just to, to note quickly, uh, Relief and Development Sunday is an opportunity to support and encourage um, our mission partners and the organisations that we, that we work along with. So one, another just very quick uh, round of applause and, and thanks to, to Moira and an encouragement for her and her work, please. It's also a chance for us to be encouraged and challenged as well. Um, so thanks, Moira, for sharing a challenge back to us. Um, and one of the things that the, the Mission Hub is here to do is to support and encourage us to think about ways that uh, each of us individually can do that as well. And it's around about this time that we encourage people to think about the, the bursary uh, scheme that is, is open and available. So if it is something that you've thought about taking an opportunity um, to, to travel um, short or long distance um, to, to experience God's uh, call, to test it out in your life or just to, to see his work um, in the wider world and to serve him in that way, then, then do, um, do have a chat if, you, if you'd like to um, explore an opportunity to go. Um, I'm more than happy to help put you in touch with our partners or other organisations um, and to tell you a little bit more about the bursary programme that can help out financially. Um, in thinking about doing that as well. But let's share the grace with one another now as, as we head out. Uh, and there's a chance to have tea and coffee afterwards um, and to chat to, to Moira and Manju also uh, and, and Ruth too. Um, okay, the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of